Can the year of return inspire the next great black migration? And this black migration, I have a term for it. I call it black sit. <laughs> kind of like Brexit. <laughs> black sit, right? OK, I didn't come up with that term, but I love it. And I feel like it expresses what I'm seeing happening. I feel like it expresses what I'm doing now, right? Black sit. Um, and every great migration has had factors that have influenced it, right? The first major migration that Africans in America had was the transatlantic slave trade, right? Now, there were factors that influenced this. There was the innovation in shipping that allowed ships to carry more cargo, go faster, get to places quicker. There was the quest for European expansion. And there were some biological factors. There was the fact that the natives in America were dying from diseases that the Europeans brought to them. There was smallpox and measles and all sorts of things. And that led to Africa. There was workers that they, wanted, that they needed to work on the fields and the, and the plantations. So that's how we got there. That was the first major migration. The next one came. It was called the Great Migration, and it's up from the South, where millions of African Americans moved from the South, from the Southern states to the Northern states. And this was around 1900, early 1900s. And there were factors that led to this migration. One of them was the boll weevil, which is a tiny insect <clears throat> that infested the cotton plantations. And at that time, cotton was king, as they say. And this was, it fueled the Southern economy. And the, when, when the boll weevil infested the crops, it you know, made it there so people couldn't um, farm, they couldn't make a living on the farms. So that was one thing. The second thing was the start of World War I. And this limited the flow of European immigrants to America. And they were the ones who were working in the factories in the north. So when they stopped coming, there was this need, once again, for labor. Where did they go? They went to the south. And another factor that influenced this great migration was that it was during the Jim Crow era. And if you don't know much about American history, this was really a horrific era. This was post-slavery, but it um, was a very restrictive time. It was, it was used to intimidate people. And at, at some states, there were up to two to three lynchings a week. And if you don't know what a lynching is, that is a public hanging. So if all of us here in this room, instead of us being here to listen to a talk, we would be here to watch a black person being hung. Imagine that two to three times a week. So all this was happening in the early 1900s, and it influenced Africans in America to move up north. And it was called the Great Migration because it's actually one of the biggest moves of people from one place to another in America. Now here we are 100 years later. The year of return. Could this be the start of the next great black migration? This is what it's starting to look like. This is what it's beginning to look like, the year of return. This was earlier this year. Groups of black people coming back to Africa, right? The year of return. Um, I think this is a powerful thing. I mean, I know we hear it, and it seems kind of like, you know, very commercial and things like that. But I think it's powerful. I think the word return is very, very powerful. It's powerful for African Americans because it implies that we were here before, right? And there are very few African countries or African heads of state or anybody who actually claims us, right? It's happened in small ways in the past, of course, with Nkrumah and other leaders, but never in this grand way that it's being done now. So, you know, when you, when you grow up in America, you have this feeling, this gnawing, and you don't know what it is exactly. It's a feeling of alienation, of displacement, and of unacceptance. So when you hear a word like return, you feel like, hmm, it, strike, it, strikes a, it stroke a chord in African Americans, because it meant something. It meant something like, there's a place that we actually can go back to. Wow, right? Another thing that it did what it, was it began to change the narrative of how the world perceives Africa. And if you, any of you have lived outside, 
if you live in America, you know that people think that Africa is the worst place on the planet. It is the place that's hot. It's the jungle. Every disease known to mankind is in Africa. We are riding elephants. I mean, there's like wars every day. I mean, it is horrible. It's hard for people in, in Ghana, in Africa, to know how bad it seems. Nobody wants to be connected to Africa. Even if you in America, all the Africans here know, is gonna, are gonna know what I'm talking about. People will be like, you African? Like, it is like a disease, a horrible disease, okay? Like, I mean, the worst thing ever, right? So with the year of return, with the power of social media, I just feel like Instagram is like the best thing that's ever happened to Africa, right? Um, you get, we get to change the narrative ourselves, right? Because when you say Africa, this is what most people think of. This is the picture that comes to their mind when you say Africa, right? And people here are like, but there's the internet. They can just Google. Google what? Google what? Why would, why would anyone think that the, all the major media outlets would not be telling the truth, would not be telling the full story? Why would people think that? What would, they, what would they see a picture like this and say, hey, I bet it's rich people in Africa. Let me Google that. Rich Africans. Like, no, they won't do it. Just like people here, you can tell them that they're poor people in America, starving people, homeless, with their children on the streets. They won't believe you. They can Google it. Poverty statistics in America, infant mortality rates in America, it's all there. Do you do it? No, you don't. So the same reason why people aren't Googling. <laughs> You're not doing it, and the information is there. It's there, and it's real, because you know when you're there walking down the streets in New York or any major city, you'll be sidestepping homeless people, dropping coins, right, and it's there, but nobody will believe you. So instead of the baby with the flies, now somebody looks up Africa on the internet, they might see this. Beautiful people, happy, enjoying themselves in Africa. Imagine that, right? So now instead of child soldiers and wars and conflict, we get pictures of welcoming and, you know, whatever people criticism they feel about things like this, it still, it, it changes the perception. A positive, it makes a positive impact, right? So instead of, oh, in case you didn't know, they all think right now, we live in the jungle, we're climbing trees and we live on tree houses. <laughs> I mean, in 2019, I'm not talking about like, no, right, today, people are like, ask me, so do you have a bathroom? Like, what? <laughs> so instead of this, we get Cardi. <laughs> okay, look, this is my riddle. We get Cardi in her Kentuckini eating kebab at Kempinski. <laughs> so say that five times real fast, right? Now, you know, some people brush off images like this. But this is a powerful thing. There are people who have never in their lives, in their 30 years, in their 40, their 50, 60 years, ever heard one positive thing about Africa. Not one positive thing about Africa, like never. So for them, this picture is revolutionary. It seems like, you know, like nothing, but that's how powerful it is, right? These are how powerful the images are. But how? How could the, going back to the migration, how could the migration work? How could it happen? You know, there are things that people don't talk about. People are like, it's so bad for the black Americans. Why don't they just get on a plane and just come over here? This is what I hear people saying this, right? You know how much it costs to come to Africa? <laughs> I don't think people realize that. You got to have a minimum, a minimum of probably $3,000, right? If you're lucky, you get a plane ticket for $1,000. That's on discount, right? You have to get a yellow fever shot. That's $200. You have to get... Um, a, the Ghana visa, that's $100 single entry. You probably got to get some malaria pills. That could cost you another $100. That's $1,500 before you leave the country, right? Now, you get to Ghana, you want to stay in a decent place, you know. Ghana's expensive. Accra is expensive, people. Accra is expensive. I know most of you know. So just say you want a basic, decent hotel, $100 a night. Is that fair? $100 a night? I mean, it's not like Kempinski or anywhere, three, four hundred dollars. Just we just gonna say basic. Say you stay for ten days, ten times a hundred thousand dollars, two thousand five hundred dollars. We haven't eaten. <laughs> we haven't taken one Uber. We haven't went to the art center yet, right? So we're over three thousand dollars, right? So this migration is gonna really limit who can come, 
It's really the privileged and the elite. So when y'all see black Americans walking around here, they are committed to be here, okay? It's, an, it's not easy, okay? So let's just say you come to Ghana on a holiday, you like it, you think you wanna move. Ah, the big challenge. Here is the big challenge. This is a picture from two, three weeks ago, the ceremony from 122, I think, African Americans received their Ghanaian citizens. How many, 126? 126, and I think a few years ago, it was about 35. So max, maybe 150 black Americans in the history have received Ghanaian citizenship. And what people don't tell you is, when you don't have the citizenship, the challenges that you have living as an illegal alien. Now, we always think about people living as illegal aliens in the West, but no, people live in Ghana as illegal aliens, right? Most of those people in that room have been living in Ghana for 20, 30 years as illegal aliens, meaning they can't open a bank account. If you don't have residency, you can't open a bank account. And just until recently now, you can't even do mobile money if you don't have a resident permit. You can't travel, there are limitations. If I'm in Ghana and I wanna to travel to, let's say Nigeria, if I don't have a resident permit, I can't even apply for a Nigerian visa in Ghana, right? So there are limitations, you know? So some people are living on extended holiday visas. That's how much they wanna be here, right? And then, let's say, if you want to move here and you want to get a job, ha. Very few international companies or companies that pay international salaries. And it's really quite difficult for an American or somebody who's used to living in the West to come and live in Ghana on a Ghanaian salary, like 2,000, 3,000 Ghana CDs a month, which is a decent salary in Ghana, let you try to do that, right? It's not easy. And let's say you get a job at a company that is willing to pay for your resident visa. These are things that nobody talks about when they say come to Ghana, move to Ghana. Nobody's telling you these things. Nobody's breaking down these costs. The company has to sponsor you. Do you know how much it costs for a company to sponsor you to get a resident visa and a work, work permit? $2,500 per year. Every year, your company has to pay that fee to sponsor you every year, right? So that really limited. That means that you either marry a Ghanaian is an option, um, or you come as an entrepreneur with a lot of money to invest in a company and maybe you can, you know, there's certain allowances for you. But or otherwise, for the regular person, it's really, really not easy at all. But we still keep doing it. We're still here. Um, this is an article that I did last year in, on Al Jazeera called Why Some African Americans Are Moving to Africa. Right, I didn't really want to do it, but I just said, okay, let me do it. And the impact that I saw, because I realized people were looking for an option, right? When you live in America, you feel like the walls are around you. You just have to accept that situation and you don't have any option. You can't leave, where would you go? You know, what can you do? And you think about migration, people leave to have a better life. If you don't think of this place as better, then you would never come, right? Now for me, I had a great life in the US. I had a great life. I lived in New York, I lived in LA, I worked for the top companies in the world, I hung with stars, I traveled. So people ask me all the time there, what are you doing? People here ask me, what are you doing? For me, I have a better life, right? Because for me, being a second class citizen in the first world, is way worse than being a first class citizen, being allowed to live in my full humanity in the so-called third world. So I think that the year return is just the start, is just the spark. What it's gonna do is inspire a lot of people to come here, to see for themselves what it's like to um, look beyond traditional media. We know they're not gonna tell us the truth. Um, and I think it's powerful. It's, it's almost revolutionary to take a stand, to even have in your mindset to want to come, to be here. And yes, it is challenging um, to live here, but I encourage you all to, you know, just definitely take that stand and, and blacks it. Okay. <laughs>